I am Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susi. And we're paranormal specialists who live in the most haunted city on earth, Savannah, Georgia. Every day is Halloween in our line of work, so join us as we spin true tales of haunts, murders, and disturbing Savannah history. I'm Madison. I'm Chris. And, and welcome, welcome to, to the most haunted city on earth. Bop, bop, boom. Hello, and welcome back to another episode of the most haunted city on earth. My name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. And over there, oh, and I'm JT Timmons. Sorry, <laughs> I am running like 19 cameras. Yeah, he's so. just going to be a voice um, off in the distance, at least for right now. Just I'm going to get my camera soon, but yeah. But yes, uh, so um, you might notice. We are in a different space. It's true. We are in the same building, but we are now in a different room that we have converted to our little studio. So super cool. Um, you will get one more episode uh, because we have been filming these out of order. We uh, have one episode that's going to be back out in our original spot. So if you see a difference, that's what's going on. Um, but yeah, so... Before we get into today's episode, we are going to go ahead and thank some new para junkies. Yes, yes, yes. I would love to thank Laura Bennett, Lisa Herrera, Michaela Gowans, Laura Swink, Emmy Graffius, Shannon Smith, and Jamie Campbell. Thank y'all so much for Thank joining you. the Para Junkie fam and supporting what we do. If you want to support us and you're not a uh, Para Junkie yet, please um, join join the Para Junkie fam. We have a we have a raucous good time and a raucous, a raucous good time. And uh, with live streams and... Apparently we're Australian. We're yeah. Like, a rock is good time. A rock is good time. Yeah. Throw a shimp on the barbie. Nar. <laughs> Nar. 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 Anyways. Um, uh, we have yeah. a lot of Australian listeners, so no, <laughs> apologies it's for It's all the, out of love. It we is do all love out of love. Guys. We please, love y'all. Please feel free to make fun of JT's southern twang. Um, yeah, please you feel daddy. free. Send us videos of it. I would love to hear it. Um, <laughs> <laughs> Honestly, great yeah. idea. Oh, but anyways, yes. so... Um, and don't forget to uh, send in videos of you making cat noises. Yes. Okay, no. That's, <laughs> what, that's what Chris All wants right, for his birthday. All right, new camera angle. Three, two, one, go. <laughs> Whoa, new camera angle. Cool. This oh. is dope. Ah. Yeah, it's like it's nice and wide now. I tried the 50 out. I do like the close-up. We'll do, the, we'll do that sometimes. But then... Um, you know, I, I like I like that too. So, yeah, let's go ahead okay. and jump into something that I actually, when Madison was telling me about it, I can't wait to hear more about this because, and I can't wait to go and visit it because that's what we're doing with the pair of junkies. As Definitely. of as of when this is um, airing, JT and I probably have already been to it. Yes. Um, so, yeah. Uh, and if you don't know what we're talking about, this is another installment in our Halloween. Halloween. Oh God! <laughs> um, real fast. No, we haven't been to it yet. When this when this airs, okay. So we're about to, and so because I have a live no stream, idea when anything's happening. It's time okay. is I so confusing. This. Don't worry about it. I I got the time and all of that stuff. I'll be so. somewhere. I will be existing somewhere, but I yes. don't know where it is when this is airing. Yes. But yes, anyway, yes, yes. so we are and going. To Don Nielsen me out at me. So thank you all. Yeah, for yeah, that. you're, you're welcome. very welcome. <laughs> you're yes, welcome. Don, yes. No. Um, no. So today we are going to be talking about one of the most infamous spots in Oahu, Morgan's Corner. Dun, 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 dun. Dun. The highway of death, practically. It is miraculously um, insane when you're reading about it. It's just there's so much mayhem that has happened on this small stretch of road in the middle of nowhere. It's basically, it's right outside of Honolulu. It's about eh, 30 minutes or so outside of Honolulu. Um, it's really bizarre that just a small patch of road just could kill so many people. But anyways, there you go. Um, so it is basically a stretch of what is called the Pali Road on the island of Oahu outside of Honolulu. Um, now, I will tell you the general ghost story that is associated to this particular place but i will tell you it's kind of one of those ghost stories that i feel like have been slapped on sure. in multiple places but it has is it a, a hitchhiker ghost not necessarily it's a, you'll 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 okay. hear okay so 
I'm sure you've heard it before. I've heard this story before. Sure. Um, so a couple's car breaks down on a dark, isolated road and won't start again. The boyfriend takes on the mantle of hero slash adventurer and says he will walk to go get help and instructs the girlfriend to stay in the car no matter what. You know where this is going. I do know where this is going. Uh, the girl is perceived as helpless and waits within the safety of the car all night, but her boyfriend doesn't return. Wait, so this happened on... on no, this is just a story. This is the story they ascribe to it. Yeah. It's classic urban legend. Yeah. Oh, so that, so that urban legend is supposed to take place? We'll talk about that in a okay. second. Okay. Yeah. yeah. It's so I'm a, confused on why this is being read. But. Well, <laughs> oh, because you it's attributed you, to this space. Yes, okay. you weren't listening. So um, yeah. this is a story that people tell about this road, but okay. this is a story story i'm just giving preface because it comes up later Got it. anyways so as i was saying because jt interrupted my <laughs> storytelling um the she was spooked and hears a scratching or tapping sound on the roof of the car she finally falls asleep and is is startled by a policeman who is knocking on the window it's daybreak and the officer instructs her to come out of the car but don't look back as they leave she looks back anyways and sees her boyfriend hanging from the tree above their car. The scratching was his fingers scraping the roof or tapping, or the tapping was his blood dripping onto the roof. No one really knows where this story originated, but variations of the popular urban legend can be found almost anywhere. The first documented instance of this story was collected in 1964 from a freshman of the University of Kansas. But since that time, the story has spread far and wide, and now it, is in uncom it isn't uncommon to encounter someone um, who knows this story. By the late 1970s, a version of the same story has said um, to circulate this area. Sure. Another urban legend is about a young woman distraught over her boyfriend leaving her. It's always the boyfriend leaving. Um, but when he leaves, he chooses a tree at Morgan's Corner where he goes to hang himself. They find the body hanging from the tree. And people say that if you look up into the tree, you will see what is a person swinging in the breeze. And sometimes, um, you know, the, there's also attributes that they are headless and also that they jump out at you and try to grab you. So that's fun. Um, All solid uh, dare situations for, exactly. for teenagers. Exactly. But the reason why we bring this up is because it will, uh, because of all the death that has happened, I think that's why it essentially sticks the best. Oh, but sure. um, so the reason why these ch uh, stories chose to stick there is a mystery, but there's definitely some incidents that would cause some reasons for hauntings. So the first reason, excuse me if I butcher these Hawaiian names because they are very complicated. Um, the, the first reason is the uh, Kaleleki Ane, um, the Battle of Nuanu. It was a furious battle between the Ka uh, Kalaniku Pules and 9,000 Oahu and Mahi warriors against Kamehamehas, Kamehamehas, this very long name. It was the chief. Uh, his Hawaiian army of 12,000 strong. The battle raged right there in the area that is now Old Poly Road and Nuanu Poly Drive, Morgan's Corner. <laughs> and um, that was where the warriors fought for control of the island. Perhaps there are still spirits of warriors lingering due to the many deaths that have occurred in and around this area. Sure. Also, very common reason for a place to be haunted. I mean, we've talked about battleground oh. hauntings a million times on this show, but there's another reason, too. This one is a little bit lengthier, so bear with me, but this is the murder of Therese Wilder. Okay. So on Wednesday, March 10th, around 11.30 a.m., two prisoners escaped from work line at the Chinese school on Smith Street near Baratania, the escapees were 21-year-old James Majors, who was serving 10 years for second-degree burglary, and 19-year-old John Palakiko, who was just involved in a recent escape from the Schofield Barracks stockade and had been transferred to Oahu prison following apprehension. Now, why did they let him out on a work release if he has an, a, a, uh, history, a history, of history of escaping? escaping? But anyways. Well, he's military, too, so that's right. Odd. It is odd, but Palakiko was serving a four-year sentence, also a, for a second-degree robbery. Upon their escape, the pair paid the 50-cent fare for a bus ride up to Nuanu Valley. 
They hid out in the hills that night and started coming down the road looking for food the next day. At one place, a dog chased them, and at another place, they did find food. They found a coconut. Then the fugitives prowled the Midkiff estate, stealing two raincoats and a bottle of citronella, because the mosquitoes are rough. Um, They returned to the hills, but while it was still light out, they again hiked down the Polly Road to renew their search for food. They approached the Wilder estate from the direction of the natural swimming hole below the estate. During the daylight, and at first, thought it was empty. First trying windows along the bedroom and failing to open any, both men crept around the poly roadside of the house and there saw Miss Wilder about to begin her evening meal. They returned to windows along the roadside of the house and succeeded in opening one in a small dressing room on the Iwa Makau um, side near the road. The room in which they entered was locked, so Matrix climbed through a 14 by 18 inch air vent to the next room. He had to be small. That's tiny. Yeah. He unlocked the door and allowed Polikiko to enter the bedroom, and they set about searching the room. Miss Wilder, hearing the noise, left the kitchen, opened the bedroom door, and switched on the lights, asking, Who are you? What do you want? Polikiko grabbed both her arms and allegedly said, Lady, we don't want to hurt you. All we want is some food. Miss Wilder was able to struggle free. They were really hangry. Um, that's me. Just want some food. But um, Miss Wilder was able to struggle free and rush to the front door, calling out in an attempt to frighten the intruders. She managed to open the door to the lanai uh, when Polikiko again grabbed her. He the a scuffle ensued, but the sixty-eight year old woman was easily overpowered. Majors pulled her to the ground and struck her in the eye. Stunned, Miss Wilder was bound and blindfolded with towels. The escape prisoners then carried the unconscious woman to the bedroom. Miss Wilder began to regain consciousness and struggled some more and was struck by both men after being thrown on the bed. Palakiko punched her twice on the chin and Major slugged her on the jaw. Miss Wilder lost consciousness and was gagged with the same towel that was used for the blindfold. From the kitchen, the men took some food and then left the same way they had entered. The escape prisoners were in the house for approximately 45 minutes. The pair followed the winding road, keeping close to the thick underbrush. They rested under a bridge on Kimo Ride and ate some food, hiding the rest. Later that night, they returned to Honolulu and the vicinity of a Chinese language school on Kapenya Lane from where they had escaped. Here, they remained until Friday night, March 12th. Balakiko and Majors attempted to steal a car and were apprehended by the owner who called the police. While waiting for the police, Majors asked for a cigarette. And when allowed to light one, he struck his captor in the mouth and fled. Great, just racking on them charges. But Balakiko was not fast enough and was caught and held. He was arrested at 10.30 p.m. Friday night and returned to Oahu prison to be placed in solitary confinement. At this time, Miss Wilder's body had not yet been discovered in her home, and Majors fled up Palolo Valley and his and hid in the hills that night, and then made his way down to Kaneohe by hitching a ride. He then stole a meat truck and drove to Waipahu, where the truck was abandoned. There he made friends with an elderly man and passed himself off as the old man's grandson for four days. On Tuesday morning, the body of Therese Adele Wilder, also known as Teddy to her close friends, was found by Mia Matayashi and Isabello Escalante, her housemaid and her gardener. Showing up for work early in the morning, the pair grew concerned when Miss Wilder didn't answer, despite her asking the gardeners to come two days early um, than usual. The home was locked and newspapers from last week were still lying on the grounds. After a while of waiting, Escalante crawled through the, a window and then let Matayashi in through the front door. I feel like these houses are easy to get into. I know, right? They saw Miss Wilder on her bed, but at first when she uh, thought she was asleep. Upon discovering the gag around her throat, they called Miss Wilder's physician who said Miss Wilder appeared to have been dead since Thursday. Dr. Morlock called the police. Miss Wilder's official death was suffocation. Her jaw was broken and the gag further impeded her breathing. And when they found her, she had been dead for five days. The police had few leads. 
The description of a car parked along Polly Road near the Wilder Estate from Thursday night to early Friday morning. A man is said to have hitchhiked along the Polly Road Thursday night and was picked up in the vicinity of the Wilder Estate. His shirt was torn and his general appearance was disheveled. Reports of two men report, uh, were reported being seen Thursday evening between 5.45 and 6 p.m. in the Wilder State. Police Chief William Hopai emphasized every policeman from Foot Patrol on is vitally interested in supplying any bit of evidence which might lead to the identity of this criminal. Don't kill children. Don't kill old people. That's the general rule of thumb unless you really want to get caught. Don't kill dogs or cats. Don't kill dogs or animals in general either. But the Board of Supervisors offered a $500 reward for any information leading to the capture of the perpetrator. And then the Honolulu Chamber of Commerce then offered a additional $1,500 reward. Police set up roadblocks questioning motorists who regularly drive down the Poly Road because it was a common commute road um, for people going into Honolulu as to whether they had observed anything suspicious in the area. Four prison escapees were being sought in connection to the Wilder case. And by Friday, March 19th, two leads were eliminated. The hitchhiker with the torn shirt reported to the police station had given his statement, clearing him of any suspicion. And the other clue, the mysterious green sedan, which had been parked near the Wilder home, was withdrawn. The green car was the closest anyone came to discovering the body of Miss Wilder that same night that the murder occurred. The car was having motor trouble and parked in the driveway of Miss Wilder's estate. It was two women inside, and they insisted on going into the home and asking to use the phone. They were talked out of it by one of the two men in the car who said he would hitchhike down the road. Don't listen to the men in your car. They're <laughs> probably wrong. They could have found the old lady. Right. She but might not have been dead at that point. Exactly. Um, so that's the rule of thumb also. Don't listen to the men in your car. But they were talked out of it by one of the two men in the car who said he would hitchhike down the road to town and borrow a car from a friend. The two women and the other man sat in the car for about two hours while 50 feet away laid the body of Miss Wilder. The final break in the case came when an officer brought in two raincoats found in the hideaway used by Palakiko and Majors. Palakiko identified the raincoats as those stolen from the Midkiff estate above the Wilder estate. He admitted to entering several homes in the area, including the Wilder home. He said they were just looking for food. At the time of questioning, he was still unaware that he was in part responsible for the death of 68-year-old widow Therese Wilder. He didn't know that she was dead. so. Well, it seems like they had no intent to kill her. Right. And they, they hit her a bunch without thinking of the ramifications of right. that. Right. Exactly. I mean... You can't hit an old lady, a 68-year-old woman, without... People are surprisingly fragile. I right. Mean, uh, don't, don't go around hitting anyone. Right. You know, you'd be surprised <laughs> at how, how easily uh, it escalates into trouble. So exactly. this all so this all happened in Morgan's Corner. This yes. is like a neighborhood, right? Yes. Okay. Her house so is right... So it's not right... just a corner. No. So the reason why... We'll, we'll talk about how it got yeah. its name in just a second. Okay, but okay, okay, this okay, is gotcha. a house on the road okay. for Morgan's Corner. I Morgan's see, Corner see, is just a portion of Polly Road. I see. So... Okay. Yeah. JT comes in and out of the room, so he misses some pieces here and there. But... Yeah. Um, anyways... So, Therese Wilder um, was obviously dead at this point, and Palikiko was taken aback to find out that um, she had actually died. And so, meanwhile, when a car was stopped at a roadblock at Kokokai and Kalanaianole highways, and the driver said that the man in the backseat was a hitchhiker who had asked for a ride from Hiai, and the officer became suspicious of the bundle uh, at the feet of the man in the back seat and began to question him. Suddenly, the man reached for his hip pocket and the officer, believing he was about to pull a weapon, dragged him out of the car. The man broke away momentarily, took a bottle from his pocket, pulled out the cork and drank the contents. The officer slapped the bottle from the man's hand and he collapsed. The man was Majors, the escaped convict they'd been searching for. It was found that the bottle from which he drank had contained iodine. Uh, he was taken to the first aid station at Kone, uh, Kane Ohe, where his stomach was pumped, and then in, to Honolulu, where he was placed in the Queen's Hospital under police guard. 
Majors attempted uh, admitted that he read the story of Mrs. Wilder's death in the newspapers and confessed to entering the home, overpowering Miss Wilder and tying her up before leaving. So, that was the big murder that happened on that road. Now, let's talk about the road itself and the killings that has occurred from that. So, the incident that really gave Morgan's Corner its name. Um, in February 1938, the police or the public started complaining about the dangerous curves on the Nuanu side of the Pol- of Polly Road. One letter to the editor said, for this purpose, the present road is altogether unsuitable and unsafe. From the junction of Mamaloha Road to the upper part of Morgan's S curve, there isn't 40 yards of straight road or visibility. That's brutal. Yeah, that is brutal. From the, this point to the foot of the cement grade, um, the road is slippery and narrow. And when ginger is in bloom, this is a favorite place for people to come and pick flowers by the roadside. There have been several fatal accidents in this stretch, and the cement grade requires trucks and heavy vehicles to go in low. The road is only wide enough for two cars, and when trucks are on the road, there is a continual stream of cars passing to the left. Was this a complaint in the 30s? Yeah, I know. Good Lord. And by July 1938, the Department of Public Works was trying to get an endorsement from the Engineering Association of Hawaii for the revised plans for the proposed Nuanu Pali Tunnel. There was much opposition by the residents of Old Pali Road, which, you know, is where Miss Wilder lived. And at the time, there didn't seem to be much public interest in the tunnels. Public Works proposed that the new r- route would eliminate the hairpin curve at the Lily Pond, traveling along the west side of the number two reservoir, and rejoin the present road at the new Waterworks aerator. But still, it would be years before plans for a tunnel were approved. And in the meantime, even though the original death curve was widened, the widened or the winding curves of Nuanu Poly Drive continued to claim the lives of unwary motorists and began to acquire a reputation all of its own. In 1938, the newspapers called that dangerous section of the road the Morgan S Curve, named after Dr. James A. Morgan, whose estate boarded the segment. In 1941, it was called the Morgan Estate Curve or Morgan Residence Curve or just simply Morgan's Corner. A 1950 article called the area both Nuanu's Death Corner and Morgan's Corner. And the complaint in this article states that more than 30 uh, years, the municipal authorities have talked about correcting the dangerous curve on Oahu's outstanding scenic road. And one excuse after another was found for postponing the work. The latest being the express highway plan ex- suggested by the territory is now the process of litigation. There also will be considerable travel at that point, And at the present, it is very heavy. The corner as it exists is a death trap. The 1950. Right? I'm excited to see it. I know, right? By 1953, the name Morgan, Morgan's Corner stuck, and for years, as the territory was working on improving the Poly Road, there were plans for a new highway that ran from Country Club Road to Reservoir Number no. Four that would eliminate commuters' need to travel down Nuanu Poly Drive through Morgan's Corner. Work had been delayed from 1949 as the territory became embroiled in a legal battle with Lester Marks over the condemnation of two acres of his property. Bruh, just give it up. Just give up the acres, you know. (laughs) No amount of human life is worth those two acres. All right. And the proposed new highway would be cutting his 17-acre estate in two with compensation for the condemnation price of $12,000. Honolulu-bound traffic cruised by up the mountain, through the tunnels, and into Nuanu Valley before bottlenecking at Reservoir Number no. Four. Drivers were anxious by the new for the new road to be built so that they could bypass the dangerous Morgan's Corner. I can imagine. And so, between 1949 and 1957, nearly 200 accidents occurred on this two-mile stretch of road. 200. Wow. On two miles of road. Debria emphasized that with some text. Two miles. That's insane. <laughs> <laughs> but with dozens of entries and three deaths that all occurred at Morgan's Corner. Regular commuters complained about the dangers in Morgan's Corner, blaming the accidents and deaths on those who were blocking the construction of the new Poly Highway. <clears throat> two acres McGee over there. <laughs> Two acres, McGee. <laughs> yes. 
in one letter to the editor stated, then I thought of the accidents, injuries, and deaths caused by Morgan's Corner. I couldn't help but wonder just how I would feel if I was the one who had stopped the building of the new road up Nuanu that would eliminate Morgan's Corner. And then I thought of the young university student killed there last Saturday. I thought to myself that if I were responsible for stopping that new road, I would surely re- feel responsible for that death and the many accidents that occur here. Ooh. Killed. Anyways. Dang. So finally, that is, that is a first class ticket to a roast. Trip. <laughs> yes. <laughs> finally, in 1956, the Marks case was settled, splitting the estate, and Lester and Elizabeth Marks retained 10 acres on the west side of the proposed highway, while the territory purchased the other seven acres, including the Marks residence. Even though the highway plans were approved, traffic and car crashes continued on a regular basis at Morgan's Corner until the Poly Highway was opened. One official sarcastically said the area should be called Morgan's Coroner. Uh (laughs) Clever. Uh Clever. Uh A pun. What? From an official. (laughs) I know, right? Nuanu Poly Drive from Carter's Corner above Country Club Road to Reservoir Number 4 was completed in October 1958. They started talking about this 20 years before that. That's insane. That is insane. Now that the dangerous Morgan's Corner would be bypassed by most traffic, traveling to and from the poly would be much safer. Although the traffic through Nuanu Poly Drive was now lighter, there were still a few accidents resulting in injuries and deaths. But there are, uh, but through our research, um, there are only two incidents that were thought to be anything other than um, car accidents. There were two reported suicides in Morgan's Oof. Corner as well. Um, they were also uh, there were also suicides that were reported up the road in what's going to be our part two of. I guess technically Morgan's Corner too, because that's what they refer to it. The and other Morgan's Corner. Yeah, the other Morgan's Corner. Um, and those other two suicides would happen at Judge Trail and Jackass Ginger Pond, which is only 15 minutes away from Morgan's you say Corner. Say Jackass Ginger Trail. Ginger Pond. Ginger Pond. Oh Jackass yeah. Jackass Ginger Pond. Yeah, Judge oh, Trail oh. and so Jackass Ginger Pond. Is the pond a jackass or is the ginger the jackass? I think it's is the it ginger. Jackass Ginger. Pond? I think the ginger's just really rude. It's like, ah, oh, I'm spicy. So I'm <laughs> <laughs> Get away from me. Get away from me. Don't look at me. And oh, so that ginger's a jackass. I know. And so some paranormal experiences that happen in Morgan's Corner. Um, so aside from the urban legends, obviously, you know, anytime you're gonna get stories like that, we, I, my f- belief at least is that it opens up an invitation for the lesser entities see more um what what would the word be uh low ringing entities (laughs) uh (laughs) that are looking for an identity and so a lot of people go out there because they're like oh maybe we'll see the the hanging person and there are reports of a hanging person now whether that is ascribed to the suicides or is it just the fact that so many people have come there to see a hanging man from the trees uh, yeah, without a like, head. You want a hanging man? I'll give you a hanging man. Exactly. I'll do the hanging man thing. Exactly. And so, um, so there's that. But there have also been um, the biggest accounts are hearing phantom screams. Like de- like blood curdling screams, like a banshee almost. No, not necessarily a banshee, but it sounds more like a person in distress. No. The um. To note, people who commit suicide oftentimes right before they let out just this the blood curdling scream. Okay. Mm-hmm. Uh, just a sort of a psych you up, a psych you. And uh, we actually, mm-hmm. uh, I had a, a friend who worked at the sheriff's department who was talking about being called in. Because someone heard a, a man screaming. You just, just sc- the scream was just so, you know, it, it really made people, like, you know, shudder, the, all the neighbors. Um, but no one heard the gunshot. He had oh. shot himself in the head. No Whoa. one heard the gunshot. They heard his scream. That's how loud the scream was. Uh, or it may be as memorable, as, as effective as it was. Yeah. But, Goodness yeah, uh, it seemed like he actually drowned out the, the sound of a gunshot with his scream. Wow. That's wild. And he and and the sheriff was like, oftentimes, especially w- with gunshots, people scream, you know, because they're working up the nerve uh-huh. to do it. And I would imagine jumping off of things, right? Probably scream 
I would think. I would I think mean. so. <laughs> Jumping off a mountain, yeah, the right. side of a cliff, practically. Right. Um, Alexandra Machado said, how can someone hang without a head? They'd slide off the rope. Right? That's literally my thought process, too. Uh, actually, uh, there is a long dissertation on the fact that you have to use a special height, a special length of n- rope, because when you hang a person, there is this, the chance that the head will pop off. Yep, if you uh, put too if, many if knots the, in if it. The, if the body weight uh, and the, the too many knots, if the, the rope is too taut, uh, the, the body weight will pull at such a degree that the rope will actually pop your head right off. Um, that is a courtesy of, of doing a lot of research for the... Uh, the torture museum <laughs> right yeah uh, well so it's interesting because there's a science to hang in there is though there's right. a perfect number of knots to right. and um, a placement because yes. you want to break the neck otherwise they just hang and strangle all right let's not give instructions let's go no ahead. we're not giving instructions <laughs> i'm no, not this giving is a history lesson yeah. yeah no i'm not giving instructions i'm not going to tell you how many knots it is but what the thing is though is you hear this a lot with our gallows um because i talked about how richard yeah. white he actually would hang for three days because the law stated you hang until dead yeah you mm-hmm. had to hang by the neck until dead and so oftentimes because Back in that time, especially going into, you know, when you get into like the Victorian era and all that, they were so morbid, y'all. They were so (laughs) morbid. And so what people would do is they would come out to the public executions and they wanted a bit of a bigger show sometimes. Right, exactly. And so they pay the executioner a little bit of money. They take- Move the knot. Move the knot, take a couple knots out, whatever it be, and it would only half break the neck. So they'd strangle to death. Or if they wanted to, they could put a few more knots in and then pop off pop the off head. head. It was really common. Um, Gracious. Yeah, so yeah. there you go. History lesson. You're right, Chris. It's a history it lesson. It is a history lesson. Um, the history of execution. Yes. And so, da, da, da. <laughs> now you know. But yeah, so um, I did not think of, you, when I heard the screaming thing, I, I did not think of the suicide stuff. I thought of maybe, you know, because there are so many deaths that have not happened sure. and brutal car accidents, because if you're falling off the side of a cliff in your car. Also, it was a battlefield. That is, was oh, not, that's true. It was not a battlefield yes. of guns. It was a face-to-face brutal battlefield. And, right. And you would imagine there's all kinds of bellowing, especially the Polynesian style of, of fighting involved mm-hmm. a lot of uh, screaming chanting. And, and chanting yeah. and, and making you know yourself larger through sound and through you know uh, so it could be the battlefield that you're hearing because it wasn't um, I don't think they had metal weapons at all right uh, I think they were using like uh, clubs with uh, with shark teeth in it and things of that nature like their weapons were, were probably not clanging the way that we would think it was right. it was a lot of bludgeoning and a lot of you know rending and ripping. This so screaming would definitely mm-hmm. happen if you got hit by one of those things. That is true. Um, this is also a common area for the night marchers to be seen, which yeah, brings us back to the battle. Um, makes sense. That so haunted. It's very haunted. It's super creepy. I'm very excited to go visit it. I really hope we don't fall off the cliff, though. Don't fall off. <laughs> Drive carefully. Very slowly. We should, we should do an Estes method. Oh, that's what I want to yeah. do. Yeah. I wonder if we could FaceTime Chris in. <laughs> I mean, and so he could ask some questions. We're going to be too. six hours behind. It's going to be the middle of the night for you or like in the middle of your day for, because yeah. we go out. We go later. out the, in the evening. Yeah. yeah maybe. Yeah. Maybe, maybe we can do that. That could, that could swing. That could be cool. Um, but yeah, some other things that happened, um, Includes the sound of screeching tire sounds, so oh, that's sure. accidents. Yeah, yeah uh, which makes sense. Residual type hauntings from really uh, traumatic incidents, and also reports of shadow figures looming. That's also that's really, draw really, figures, really so. common um, in highly haunted areas like yeah. that, or like areas that I've seen a lot of death. You'll find those parasitic type entities, mm-hmm. which shadow figures can be. Of course, we've talked about shadow figures can be a number of different things. Um, But in the case of this, I saw this when we were at Helen's Bridge. I kept seeing these shadow figures around. It's they're just looking. Well, they're drawn to the stories that people tell. They're drawn to the identity that they could that they could receive. And they're drawn to people who are open because Mm -hmm. that's another thing. As you show up at these high haunted places, you are automatically saying, I'm I'm a ghost enthusiast. <laughs> I, right. I, I'm I'm about haunting, and these shadow figures they need 
you know, they're parasitic. They need some form of connection, some form of, of, of way back into, into a, a life pattern. And so it's a, it's an easy place to pick up a spirit. So uh, it is. be be mindful if you're going to go to haunted places that shadow shadows are oftentimes entities that don't have an identity but are seeking one. So you know, be cautious with your brain. It's true. <laughs> don't spend a lot of time coming up with with answers to the questions of what was that, what is that. Yeah, don't get, don't pay them much attention. If you see yeah. them, if you see them out of the corner of your eye or whatever, just ignore them. Ignore them. Yeah. Um, and then the last thing that people have reported is hearing a woman wailing for help, which, again, makes sense. Um, I saw in so many of the tour company websites, they're like, oh, it's Miss Wilder. And I'm like, it's not Miss Wilder. Not Wilder. Um, mm-hmm. I think Miss Wilder's case is a really creepy incident and really brutal incident. And I'm sure there might be some energy well, in her she, house. She opened the door and screamed out for her neighbors before that, she was Oh, she that's was, true. She was caught. Yeah, are there are there more haunted places that uh, like are there haunted places that have more residual hauntings than intelligent and then vice versa? Oh Absolutely. sure. And yeah. why yeah. would this have like it sounds like there's a ton of residual haunt like a bunch of sounds people hear, a bunch of like that type of energy, a bunch of stuff on repeat. What uh, what would make that so the case? you have so many abrupt deaths. Okay, that, abrupt that are, that are occurring, you know, uh, uh, which which are like like spikes in emotional energy, you know, when somebody has that terror of about to mm-hmm. be, you know, uh, about to die, that kind of thing definitely resonates, re- it holds in place, and, it, and and the varied nature of it, the multiple people of varying things. If you've got a suicide, if you've got a car wrecks, if you've got a murder, if you've got a battlefield, all concentrated in one area. Um, and let's not forget that uh, for eons, we believed that there was land that you should not build on, that there was land that was not supposed to have any form of human interaction. It sounds uh, like this is lands. definitely one of those. Uh, yeah, I was about to say, when, when you've got a two-mile radius of, of, of land that is, that is claiming that much calamity, you might, be, you might be dealing with something that is you are trespassing. You know, mm-hmm. you're, you're where the night marchers are marching uh, and, and you put a road there and right. you did all these things. So so it's not uncommon to think that, you know, um, we used to have very elaborate rituals to build bridges over waterways uh, for fear that the water spirits would knock the bridges mm-hmm. down. Uh, every culture has something along the lines of this, this ground is sacred, this place is sacred. So maybe we are dealing with that kind of or that level of um, interaction where the the land itself was like nothing belongs here but nature and you're and you're ruining it and, mm-hmm. and Hawaii is a lot like that you know Hawaii very is, much is, so is kind of a pristine place that we invaded and paved and put resorts on and and we have a highly opportunistic industry there when ideally it's you know it's the home of, of gods, you know, it's, it's, mm-hmm. it's really just this, this beautiful, pristine island that we're, we're mucking up with a lot of, of industry. It's true. You know, and, um, it's not surprising that this is so haunted. I completely agree with that theory of, you know, it's land spirits that mm-hmm. are not happy, or I could totally see the warrior spirits as well, because it's, this was a big, big battle in their history. Right. It was, it, it was so pointed that they needed control mm-hmm. of this island. And this is where the battle took place. So many people were trying to vie for it. And then you build a suburb. Right. It, you know? And then, you know, you expect that you're going to build a road that's going to, you know, bring strangers and outsiders up and down all, all hours of the night and all manners of ways. It's 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 interesting to think that at one time a mighty chief led twelve thousand warriors to protect and defend that right. chunk of land, and uh, two miles with twelve hundred people. That's right. insane to think yeah. about. That's that's a lot of people, but yeah, it's. Uh, I'm very excited to see it. Um, yeah, we'll, same. We'll let and you then know. And there's a second one. Well, okay. So the reason why, so it's not technically a continuation of Morgan's Corner. Okay. It's the the reason why they call it Morgan's Corner Two is because it equally kills 
a lot of people. So there's a lot of okay. mirror. Yeah, uh, and so they, they're like, it's like a second Morgan's Corner, and it's only 15 minutes up the road on the same road, well, there which you go. leans even more into the thought the process. Sacred land yeah, concept. Exactly. But fascinating stuff. Hawaii is super creepy. Wee. Very excited to go experience its ghosts and its spirits in general. But, but remember, you can't do it without a Maui Wowie. So a what? A Maui Wowie. What's a Maui Wowie? It's what is what is a, is it a drink? <laughs> oh, okay. It's like a Bahama Sounds Mama. Like it. Yeah. Well, I know that Bahama Mama is. It's but just there's a, a it's go, go it's a Maui Wowie. <laughs> now I got to try a Maui Wowie. I'm going to send will. a photo on Patreon. I'm going to post a photo. And we're all going to have Maui Wowies. So. Yeah. J- well, JT, um, <laughs> JT's funny. You guys will see this, especially on Patreon. Um, he is not a beach person. <laughs> he is a mountain person, which luckily Hawaii is both very right. beachy oh, and yeah. mountainous. So that leans into both. Um, but he is the type of person that wears jeans on yeah. the beach and um or in all black well i just don't yeah i just don't swim he looks like okay if you remember that scene from sweeney todd <laughs> that's what jt looks like yeah, <laughs> yeah. No, that's beach. exactly it to be honest yeah I, I i really can't stay in the beach but i'm excited to go to hawaii and see hauntings and spend time with the fam yeah and do pair junk exclusives and all of that stuff all of that stuff yeah live streams it's gonna be Eat so lots fun. of fish Oh, yeah. I'm going to eat a lot of fish. I'm going to do a lot of fishing. It's going to be great. I'm just not going to get in the water. But that's fine. I will. I, oh, that's I know. All I'm Madison's a fish. I, I am a fish. I'm going to her. I, maybe I was a siren in a past life. I don't know. That would be cool. All right. Patrick is here. So right. we're going to get him in. Patrick Welsh is here. All righty. Uh, yeah, well, and so we're going to get him in and uh, we're going to talk about Morn- Morgan's Corner 2. Yes. So let me wrap this up real quick. But thank you guys so much for listening. I hope you enjoyed today's episode. And my name is Madison Timmons. I'm Chris Susie. Stay spooky, y'all. <laughs>